Thank you very much, Mr. Rector. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. It's great to see all of you here. I feel sorry some of you have to stand. Uh, we got a couple more chairs up here in the front if you'd like to come down. Um, no, but thanks very much for uh, coming and uh, being ready to listen to me talk a little bit about uh, the economy. Uh, I think most of you know yesterday was uh, Lenin's birthday. Uh, the timing when I was told this uh, seemed a little bit ironic because I've come here to share with you today my thoughts on the need for economic and business reform in Ukraine. As you know, for 20 years, the United States government has shared its ideas, provided assistance to help Ukraine become the democracy and the market economy ruled by law that I know all of you want. So I've come today to update you on what the U.S. thinks should be done. Stodelet. I couldn't think of a better place to come and address the issue than the new economic university. This fine institution, as I was saying to the rector, has a great reputation. I've met so many people in my time here in Ukraine who are graduates of this great institution. And today it continues its role to prepare you, the current students, to become members of the economic and business vanguard of this great country. Sixty years ago, a famous American general named Dwight Eisenhower was elected President of the United States. Just before his election, Eisenhower made a statement that is still very often quoted today. He said, neither a wise nor a brave man lies down on the tracks of history to wait for the train of the future to run over him. He went on to serve two terms as President and led my country in many, many good ways, including making investments in its future that are still paying off for us today. Many of you may know that our whole interstate highway system, our space program, all of this was launched under President Eisenhower's administration. Now his words apply to what I want to talk to you about today. That is, investing in your country's future by strengthening institutions and pursuing economic reform. I believe this is a recipe for increasing stability, creating opportunity for all, including graduates of academic institutions like this one. Change affected through government action never comes easily because there are always people who have a stake in the status quo. Reform by definition involves connecting a situation, correcting a situation to make things work more effectively and getting a political consensus to travel down that road is often politically very arduous. Look at my own country, the United States of America. Today we face particularly strong challenges to reforming our social safety net so that we can meet people's needs and be soundly financed for the next generation. Our struggle to get there has, as you all know from reading the papers and watching TV, caused enormous political discord in the United States. Even at times, it's disrupted our government operations. However, there is a fundamental agreement across the political spectrum in the United States that if we face these challenges successfully, we will experience significantly higher growth. We don't have it all figured out yet. We don't have a consensus. But we've been working on shaping our own economic system by using the tools of democracy now for over 200, nearly 250 years. And I think our history shows how smart reform has been essential to economic success. And I believe the same can hold true for the challenges faced by Ukraine. So let me use some time today to share some thoughts about your economic future, drawing on our own experience. Let me take a cue from former President Clinton. It's always good to take a cue from Bill Clinton because he was one of our smartest and best presidents in my view. In June of 2000, he spoke at St. Michael's Square, Mikhailovsky Plosha. Some of you might have been there as young people. He said at that time that uh, he very nicely articulated both the posture of partnership to Ukraine, but also the need to make a transition to a market-based democracy. Clinton said, and I'm going to quote from his speech, America will stand by you as you fight for a free and prosperous future. I cannot tell you how to build your future, but I do believe this. I believe Ukraine has the best opportunity 
in a thousand years to achieve both freedom and prosperity. You are on your way. All you need now is to stay on course, to pick up speed, open the economy, strengthen the rule of law, promote civil society, protect the free press, break the grip of corruption. You must use your freedom to make sure you and your children prosper in peace. America is your friend and your partner. President Clinton said, you are on your way. But we have to recall that at independence, Ukraine inherited an economic system that used cheap energy to create commodity products like metals and chemicals. This country has come a long way since that time, but the legacy of its past economic structure remains a challenge in an era of now increasingly expensive natural gas and oil. There is clear value to be had in economic diversification, but to get there, it will take reform and new institution building. Many experts believe that one way Ukraine can help itself is by attracting more foreign investment into underdeveloped economic sectors. For example, agriculture, domestic energy production, manufacturing, as well as high-value-added high services like software development. To move in this direction, it will be important for the RADA to work with President Yanukovych to continue the process of economic reform. Fortunately, reform in Ukraine does not involve reinventing the wheel, as we say. There's, there has for years been an extraordinary amount of good advice prepared for this country. For example, the International Commission of Independent Experts, chaired by Anders Osland and Alexander Paskover, provided a comprehensive assessment in 2010 of what needs to happen going forward. You may recall that their first recommendation was carry out gas reform. And they went on to address such issues as the budget, land sales, and commercial legislation. Numerous NGOs and institutions have offered their own well-crafted recipes for advancing the reform process here. These include the American Chamber of Commerce, the European Business Association, and others. And let's not forget that McKinsey produced a very helpful report in 2009 entitled Reviving Ukraine's Economic Growth that contains insights into structural changes that are still very relevant today. I merely wish today to emphasize the importance of following through. The studies are there. The ideas are there. The experts agree on what needs to be done. What needs to be done, though, is needs political will on the part of the leadership of this country to make the necessary changes. In the end, it boils down to this. American corporations, who I work with closely here in Ukraine, tell me that to help Ukraine unlock its economic potential, there first must be improvements in the commercial environment. American companies, and I think European companies, I think Ukrainian companies, want to spend less time on tax inspections and more time looking for ways to grow. Business needs to know that contracts and deals will be honored and that intellectual property rights will be protected. Corporations are looking for an economy and consumer market that can expand robustly as a result of sound macroeconomic policy and management in an environment where the rule of law is firmly established. Such an environment can only come about amidst a commitment to executing reform and building inclusive and strong institutions. Okay, you have to now put up with me for a few minutes because I'm going to talk like a political science professor. I recently read a book, which some of you may have read, and if you haven't, I recommend it. it. It's a book called Why Nations Fail, and it was one of the most popular and the most insightful books published last year in the United States. It's written by Darren Asimoglu of the Massachusetts Institute for Technology and James A. Robinson of Harvard University. It contains a broad survey of world history and an insightful analysis of numerous individual countries although it does not address Ukraine directly. Nevertheless, the book has a lot to say for anybody who is a student of economic and political systems, and I would offer for Ukraine's economic and political system. The fundamental thesis of the book is that institutions matter.
political and, in and economic institutions are critical to a nation's development. History, culture, and geography count, but whether a nation puts into place sound political and, ex and economic institutions will dictate, can dictate, whether it succeeds. In one of the sections of the book, the authors compare North Korea and South Korea. Here's a case of, of a people that have shared the same history, the same land peninsula, but they've been divided for many, many years, as you know. Moreover, the economic development of these two states could not be more starkly different. The authors believe that the difference lies in the South Koreans' development of effective institutions. They write, and here I'm going to quote, inclusive economic institutions such as those in South Korea or in the United States are those that allow and encourage participation of the great mass of people in economic activities, that make best use of their talents and skills, and that enable individuals to make the choices that they wish. To be inclusive, economic institutions must feature secure private property, an unbiased system of law, and a provision of public service that provides a level playing field in which people can exchange and contract. It also must permit the entry of new business and allow people to choose their careers. The authors go further and argue, quote, a businessman who expects his output to be stolen, expropriated, or entirely taxed away will have little incentive to work, let alone any incentive to undertake investments and innovations. Asimoglu and Robinson argue that there is a synergy between political and economic institutions. They write, extractive political institutions concentrate power in the hands of a narrow elite, and they place few constraints on the exercise of power. Economic institutions are then often structured by this elite to extract resources from the rest of society. Extractive economic institutions thus naturally accompany extractive political institutions. In fact, they often form a vicious circle mutually reinforcing each other. Extractive institutions, by creating unconstrained power and great income inequalities, increase the potential stakes of the political game because whoever controls the state becomes the beneficiary of this excessive power and the wealth that it generates. The authors conclude, nations fail today because their extractive economic institutions do not create the incentives needed for people to save, invest, and innovate. Extractive political institutions support these economic institutions by cementing the power of those who benefit from the extraction. So, to my way of thinking, and why have I raised this with you, Asimoglu and Robinson, I think, have conceptualized the problem of economic development in the modern world for all nations. Quite simply, but also quite profoundly. A society where power is not shared, where economic decisions favor the few rather than the large majority of a country, where property is controlled by a small group, and where the rule of law is undercut by a corrupt law enforcement and judicial system, it is simply not going to do as well as a country which promotes openness, fairness, the rule of law, a dynamic media, and overall a level playing field. Let me be clear. I'm not saying Ukraine is a failed or a failing state. To the contrary, it is a country of vast potential, both natural and human. But I think to realize that the potential Ukraine has, it, the country must put aside those aspects of the extractive economy and political system and fully embrace reform. Ukraine must act against raider attacks. Ukraine must attack gross corruption, the lack of protection of physical property and particularly intellectual property. Ukraine must be against the unjust adjudication of issues by courts and, a still, and the huge and still widening gap in the distrib distribution of income between rich and poor. Now, I could go on, but I think you get the point. 
Simply put, reform must change the rules of the game if Ukraine is going to be effective in competing in the international global marketplace. By making difficult decisions today, the government of Ukraine can bring its people huge positive payoffs in the future. History shows us that countries that implement comprehensive economic reforms have higher growth rates. Economic reforms improve adaptability, particularly when changes from abroad affect an economy. Reforms remove distortions and reduce the risk of economic crises. Examples of outcomes from smart reforms include increased trade, a better functioning labor market, greater budget transparency, a healthier financial sector, and new investment by foreign and domestic corporations, and of course, higher growth, perhaps at an average rate of 4% or more annual in U Ukraine, which is possible according to many economists who have studied the country. Let me highlight four areas that I think need, Ukraine needs to focus its attention on in reform. First, it needs to pursue policies and reform that build strong relationships with foreign partners. Second, it must enhance the rule of law, which as I've said several times, bolsters the business climate. Third, it must signal that the door is truly open to businesses in those sectors where Ukraine wants to diversify its economy. And fourth, Ukraine must ensure that higher education is shaped by the future economic needs of the country. Let me go back and describe each one a little more, in a little more detail. Let me talk about relationships with foreign partners, especially with the European Union and the International Monetary Fund. We believe in the United States that enhanced engagement with the European Union will offer Ukraine the best guarantee of prosperity and stability for current and future generations as it has for so many of your neighbors. For example, since joining the European over eight years ago, the economy of your neighbor Poland has expanded approximately 43% or 5% a year, and it continues to grow this year. Indeed, during the recent global financial crisis, Poland was the only EU country not to have a recession. 20 years ago, Poland and Ukraine had roughly equal per capita income, equal per capita income. And today, Poland's income is three times that of Ukraine. The United States welcomed the initialing of the text of the association agreement between the EU and Ukraine, and we hope that the agreement can be signed later this year as envisioned in the recent EU-Ukraine summit in Brussels. The association agreement offers Ukraine a path to economic reform and prosperity in line with that found in the EU. We believe this would send a very powerful signal to foreign businesses looking to expand their commercial activities here. Now, I agree with Ukraine's ambassador to the European Union, Konstantin Yeliseyev, who I count as a friend. Some of you may remember he wrote an article not long ago in, I think it was Commerçant, where he argued the importance and the merits of the association agreement. He said that the terms of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement embedded in the association agreement include liberalization of trade not only in goods but also in services, liberalization of capital movement, and to a certain extent, movement of labor. Unlike a conventional free trade agreement, the DCFTA will also require a comprehensive adaptation of European regulatory legislation in the areas of transport, energy, services, agriculture, and other key areas. Yeliseyev pointed out a study that found that the DCFTA with the EU would, grow, would boost growth approximately three times as much for Ukraine over the long term as would the customs union. And let me note that the United States recently announced that we will pursue a new freight trade agreement with the EU, which I think is a very significant development, not just for us in Europe, but I think eventually for Ukraine. Because given that our two economies amount, the United States and Europe, to roughly half of the world's economic output. I also hope to see Ukraine succeed in its efforts to re-engage with the IMF. The IMF's approach is based on experience, stabilizing and reforming the economies of many countries. 
Now, successful engagement with the IMF would reinforce confidence among international lenders, potential donors, and I think private investors. Over the years, Ukraine moved forward in areas where it committed with the IMF to reforms, such as with regard to pensions and to strengthening the banking sector. However, other commitments went unfulfilled, like rationalizing gas and heating tariffs, reforming the VAT refund system. The reforms which the IMF advocates, advocates are for Ukraine's own good, not for the IMF. They will need, they could lead, they will lead, if implemented, to a more prosperous future for this country. The importance of rule of law simply cannot be overestimated. It is vital to improving the business climate and to bolstering economic development. Courts have to be able to reliably settle disputes, uphold contract obligations fairly and consistently. Otherwise, entrepreneurs, foreign investors will look at other markets, not wanting the profits from their own hard work to be stolen by rivals or corrupt officials. Here in Ukraine, in the absence of reliable protection of physical property rights and intellectual property rights, the business climate will remain weaker than its potential, and many of the best educated people in this country will seek to leave the country for greener pastures abroad. Foreign businesses will think twice before investing when they have alternatives in more predictable and more welcoming markets. In my time here as ambassador, I've heard about many potential investors who at the very last minute decide to decline to come to Ukraine because they've heard stories or they've read reports of foreign businesses already here that have encountered severe problems. Problems like the inconsistent application of the law, with <clears throat> whether with regard to corporate raids or ensuring the timely disbursement of VAT payments. I want to say this as simply and as plainly and as clearly as possible. Strengthening the rule of law in Ukraine is integral to the effective functioning of all the institutions and processes that are essential to business activity. Entities involved in tax collection and facilitating the flow of imports and exports. Agencies involved in giving permits and licenses that set minimum standards for professional services. Government offices involved in construction or modification of buildings and regulators like antitrust agencies that are essential for a strong business climate. Judges need to be professional, fair, accountable, and independent from influence or intimidation from prosecutors or other government bodies and private interests. They simply cannot be used, as they are today, to further illegal activity. Nor could there be a perception that courts can be used illegally, and the prosecutor's nearly unchecked power to intervene in every aspect of private life or business activities must be cut back to meet international standards. That power must be limited by law to serving public and not private or self-interest. Now, it seems so obvious that faith in the rule of law is essential for business confidence. But make no mistake, in the absence of the rule of law, corruption strangles the existing economy and the perception of systemic corruption prevents new economic growth. Let me make a special note here about small and medium businesses. This can be and must be the backbone of Ukraine's economic future. SMEs account for the vast majority of firms in the United States, and small and medium in enterprises in the United States account for approximately half of our gross domestic product. Think of that. The biggest economy in the world and small and medium businesses account for half of our GDP. They're major drivers of, our, of U.S. employment. Rule of law addresses obstacles to small business deployment in the United States, such as fear of arbitrary or lengthy settlement of disputes with authorities. It draws such enterprises out of the shadows and encourages financial institutions to back them. Our experience with SMEs is, such, is, is that such entities lead the way toward higher value added economic activity. 
Encouraging small business growth would also help Ukraine diversify its, econo its economy toward innovative and value-added sectors. In order to do that, however, there must be confidence that officials will not be corrupt, institutions will not be predatory, and raiders will not be successful. More broadly, with regard to the business climate, I was pleased to see that Ukraine recently moved from number 152 to 137 in the World Bank's doing business rankings. That was impressive that Ukraine jumped 66 places to number 50 for the category of starting a business. That's good news. We hope to see more of startup businesses in this country as a result of this encouraging trend. But Ukraine still has to wrestle with the fact that in other rankings, it falls below every other European country. In Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index, Ukraine is number 152 out of 182. In the Index of Economic Freedom of the Heritage Foundation in the States, Ukraine is 163 out of 183. Several spots below Belarus. In the World Economic Forum Global Competitive Ranking, Ukraine is 83 out of 142. Clearly, more needs to be done. Let me note the importance in particular of intellectual property rights to Ukraine's reputation as a location for commercial activity. People who use their intelligence to create products like music, software, movies, or even formulas for new drugs are sources of innovation for an economy. Their assets need to be protected if they're going to continue making these new innovation, innovations. Unfortunately, Ukraine is on the United States priority watch list with regard to the state of intellectual property rights protection, meaning that we have very serious concerns about that here. Today, a, major, a, major, a major group of right hold, rights holders in the U.S. have asked the United States government to single Ukraine out as the sole priority foreign country in the world, a designation that would express the highest level of concern about the state of IPR protection here in Ukraine. A final decision has not been made. The situation is being analyzed in Washington. But the fact that the issue is even raised, that it's even on the table, demonstrates how seriously this is viewed in the United States. And I can tell you the European Union has the same kinds of concerns. Without adequate intellectual property rights, new businesses starting up in software, music, and other areas are vulnerable to having their most important assets stolen. This means the impressive improvement in starting a business will have a much lower actual benefit than expected. Your institutions of higher learning produce brilliant, skilled engineers and programmers but their ability to capitalize on their education and talent is hampered by the lack of intellectual property rights protection. Finally, I want to focus on two last, but I think critical areas for Ukraine's future. First, there is a need for a clear path forward for investors in areas likely to grow in economic importance. We've been very pleased that the Ukrainian government has signed a production sharing agreement with Shell and is now in the process of trying to complete agreements with ExxonMobil and Chevron. The Ukrainian government has worked hard with these companies to develop procedures and laws that will facilitate the long-term investment of billions of dollars that will be needed to boost the energy sector and promote energy independence in Ukraine. In five to seven years, the experts will tell you that Ukraine could be producing significantly more of its own gas, and if it uses energy more efficiently, you could even be an energy exporter. Further, changes in the global gas supply and reforms in the EU gas market are giving Ukraine new options when it comes to selecting how and from whom to import the energy that you need. Ukraine also recently took step forward on the path to adopt the standards of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. This is an organization the countries of whom are members uh, pledge to meet high standards in all their energy products. Now, I hope Ukraine will continue to expand its efforts in this energy arena, moving into other areas. It's up to Ukrainians, for example, to determine how to go forward on land reform. But it's clear that if the terms of land usage and leasing are modified, there's huge room for foreign investment and enormous productivity gains in the agricultural sector that will help revive economies 
and the lives of many people who live in rural areas. The second critical issue is education. In my country, 2012 marked the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act, legislation which was signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln. It led to the establishment of public agricultural land-grant universities. Now, the economic benefits of those universities, of public universities in the states, have been enormous. Agricultural universities enabled small farmers to improve both grain yields and household incomes dramatically. Per hectare wheat production quadrupled in the United States from 1866 to 2000. Corn production was raised six times, increasing rural incomes and reducing prices on store shelves. U.S. farms and firms advanced further to produce high-value products. For example, California's very famous wine industry owes much, both in terms of achieving consistent high quality and in expanding to new areas of production to the research and guidance provided to it by the University of California at Davis. Public universities in the U.S. carry on land-grant tradition today by making higher education available to the majority of Americans and, this is the key part, by providing research useful for businesses in all sectors. Unfortunately, Ukrainian universities are too often separated from the practical concerns of domestic private enterprises. Both higher education and private business will improve their performance if they can bridge that gap. Now, I realize there are very vigorous debates underway here in Ukraine about how to take higher education forward. I believe consideration of the skills which the economy needs, coupled with the principles of openness, transparency, and the autonomy of educational institutions are powerful beacons in this regard. These are the hallmarks of educational systems in countries that are competing successfully in the global market. Entrepreneurs and company leaders can provide financial support when merited. They can also provide oversight to ensure that degrees conferred represent true mastery of the disciplines important to a competitive economy. Progress toward Ukraine's universities having greater commercial relevance could be aided by setting them free to innovate and reducing outmodal, outmoded models of centralized state control that are a leftover from the Soviet times. To conclude, the United States has been and will continue to be a partner with Ukraine as it pursues its reform agenda. Over the last 20 years, USAID has provided policy and technical assistance across all the economic sectors in this society. For example, USAID developed programs to mass privatize nearly 10,000 industrial enterprises, 50,000 small and medium enterprises, to put 1.8 million land titles into the hands of private farmers, to create a legal aid network for landowners, to assist Ukraine in achieving World Trade Organization membership on February the 5th, 2008, and to establish performance-based program budgeting within Ukrainian municipalities. In the end, it all boils down to this. Strong institutions, coupled with clear and transparent rules and processes, harmonized with best practices, can boost the long-run economic growth and resilience of Ukraine. I wish all of you the very best in your studies at this great institution. And when you graduate, I hope you will become part of the vanguard, as Mr. Lennon would have said, but of a vanguard of business and economic reformers which this country desperately needs and which I'm sure will eventually lead to the proud place among the most globally competitive nations in the world for Ukraine. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm Katerina Frolenka, uh, Faculty of International Economics and Management, uh, first year student. And uh, I have a question. You mentioned reforms in the gas sector of Ukraine, and um, given the fact that the US planned to export shale gas to Europe, and uh, American companies uh, Chevron and uh, ExxonMobil uh, plan to uh, develop uh, unconventional gas resources in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. 
um, please express your view on how these changes will impact uh, energy security in Europe and what's more important, gas prices in Ukraine and reforms in, in gas sector of Ukraine. Good. Good. Thank you. That's a good question. I get that question a lot. Um, yesterday was Earth Day. How many of you knew that? Yesterday was the day that was created in the United States that has now expanded to every nation in the world to take care of the environment. Not to destroy the environment, but to conserve it. The man who created Earth Day was one of my heroes, a senator from the state of Wisconsin named Gaylord Nelson. None of you would know him. But the man cared passionately about the environment and not doing anything to damage it. I think today Gaylord Dulson would be a supporter of the shale gas because he would say to you, yes, some mistakes have been made. We had a bunch of independent companies. They weren't regulated very well, and a few mistakes were made. But the fact is that today in the United States, we have not only companies that have developed the technologies, but we have regulations that have been uh, uh, imposed and created to make sure that environmental standards are maintained high. Let me just give you a sense of what shale gas has done to the United States. About two years ago, most of the world's energy experts said that the United States would actually import 80 billion cubic meters of gas this year. In fact, we now have more gas than we know what to do with because the shale gas revolution and the reason we call it a revolution is because it's changed so quickly, has basically, it's make, going to make us an exporter of gas. We now have more gas developed in the States than they do in Russia. And, but the best news, I think, is that we've also developed a regulatory system so that this gas can be recovered from shale in a, in a safe, and in a way that actually is going to enhance business and enhance jobs. And there's a lot of propaganda out there, and I would urge you to look very hard at, uh, you know, go look at all the websites. Go look at Chevron's website. Go look at Shell's website. They'll show you how they're going to do the drilling here to make sure that there, aren't, there isn't any environmental damage. And I know these big companies are doing it in the States. Fracking, which is the process, you know, of cracking the rock to, to release the gas, that's not new. It's been around for 60 years. But what it's been new for is now going at these rocks underneath, uh, down, uh, say, 4,000 feet, to break them open and release the gas that's trapped in there. I think this is going to change Europe. Now, I understand that in the States, the land is owned by individuals. In Europe, it's owned by... Uh, by, by, by governments and states, and there's a lot of other differences, and I don't have time to talk about that. But I think that if this is managed properly, <clears throat> if the drilling is done carefully, that this can enhance Ukraine's future. Now, in addition to shale gas, ExxonMobil is already is hoping to, uh, they're finishing a contract now that will allow them to drill offshore. Just so you know, if you can imagine Think of the map of Romania and Ukraine. Draw the line where the water would be Romanian waters and then Ukrainian waters. ExxonMobil and a consortium have already found gas and oil offshore Romania. The, the segment of your offshore water that they are drilling in is right next door to it. They're very confident that they're going to find gas and oil there. This will bring, I think, not only greater supplies, but I think the price is going to come down, and what's going to happen is uh, the people who were going to export gas into the states, like Qatar, Trinidad and Tobago, they were, Qatar even built a big uh, liquid natural gas facility down in Louisiana, and they've had to go and re-engineer it to turn it around, so that instead of getting the liquid natural gas and regasifying they're now going to have to take the gas and then use that as the way to export probably to Europe. There's big liquid natural gas facilities being built in Poland, Croatia, and I think some other capitals. I think this is going to change the whole European energy market. Uh, how this is going to have an impact on things like uh, the gas transit system here, uh, South Stream. 
I mean, my understanding is that North Stream, which was built at a huge cost, that today it's got a 55 billion cubic meter capacity and 10, bil 10, 10 billion cubic meters are coming through, one-fifth. Anyway, there's going to be more gas, it's going to be cheaper, and I think Ukraine has the potential, if it plays its cards right, if it has good leadership and makes the right decisions, Ukraine can be right at the center of this whole gas revolution that can come in Europe. And in particular, I'm referring to the fact that you have something nobody else has. You have that huge 21 billion cubic meter uh, underground reservoir to store gas in western Ukraine, which is perfectly positioned to be a part of the new gas market in Central Europe and the, the rest. Uh, I'm not an expert. I've, I've tried really hard to learn this. I've got smart people on my staff who send me stuff all the time. But I'm convinced that this can be done. I'm convinced the shale gas, if it's done properly and with regulation, uh, can, can have an impact. In fact, we're so confident of that. We had a conference last November in Ivano-Frankivsk, because that's one of the areas where Chevron will drill if they get their contract signed. And we brought, the United States government brought from, you, from the states the regulators of the shale gas industry in the states of Texas, Colorado, and Pennsylvania to teach the local people, to share with the local people their experience and how you regulate it. And Chevron welcomes this. Chevron and Shell will both tell you, we want a regulated environment. It's better for us for business that way. But it's also better for people and for confidence that this is going to be done the right way. If you look at the American experience, there, have been, there were some bad cases of some independence. There's no question about it. But I think fundamentally now, the big companies have the technology, they have the experience, and I think this can be a success for Ukraine. Mr. Taft, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm very grateful for this because you brought us hope. You know, we lack it here in Ukraine very oftenly. And I'm a student of the Department of uh, Agriculture, and uh, my question would be a follow-up on the previous one, but concerning uh, agriculture. We saw a lot of scientific advances uh, in many areas, like shale gas, just a few days ago, Antares rocket, which was built by Ukrainian and American mm -hmm. scientists, went into space. So we see a lot of uh, scientific collaboration here. But there is one huge area that is very important to Ukraine, and the uh, United States is a pioneer in it, but we are left over from it. From it. It's uh, genetically modified crops. Mm -hmm. You know, it, we have great... Uh, potential to use it and probably would be a great idea to do something like you did with uh, uh, this conference in Nevano from mm -hmm. to bring experts on GMOs here in Ukraine, bring farmers, bring people who already tested that technology, bring residents who live next to these crops. You know, we need this impulse because we have great land, we need our productivity to grow and this would be a great uh, thing to do. I, I believe that would be a next green revolution that was led by Norman Borlaug. And once again, thank you for... Okay, all good. You. Thank you for that uh, question and comment. Uh, in fact, we have been sharing regularly with the, uh, the government and university studies that have been done in the States on uh, uh, GMOs. I, I really like it. You know, I, I forgot to show... I, whenever my friends come uh, from the United States, I see that uh, I show them these bottles of water that says, Bez GMO. Uh, just to make sure that there's, it's not anywhere. It's not in the food, it's not in the water. But you know, again, I'm not a scientist, but I come from the state of Wisconsin, which is a dairy state. And, you know, we have benefited there enormously from some of the uh, innovations in seed and other things. And I'm not aware of any research that shows that the genetically modified material has any impact on health or science. There's a lot of propaganda out there. There's a lot of people who are scared of what they don't know. I, and I understand. I, I, you know, I don't want to give my kids, uh, I didn't give my kids stuff that I was, uh, was afraid because I, I felt my responsibility as a parent. 
Now, I think we can actually do more, and I've been telling this to my agricultural attaché. But, you know, frankly, this is also the role of the government here, that they have to try to stand up, and scientists have to stand up and say, there's, no, there's nothing there. there. We have not found the problem. Uh, it's like the, you've uh, put the, uh, you know, the prisoner in the, in the courtroom and said, you are guilty, you have to show you are innocent, as opposed to the other way around. And, uh, you know, the stories of the, the, the success of GMOs, seed and other things in the developing world, with uh, war, you know, the, the seed that doesn't take as much water, that resists um, disease, that resists uh, bugs and all of these things. It, 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 the record is very, very clear about this, but you just have to kind of look at it and you have to get past some of the propaganda that exists here. But your point's a good one and I think it's something that, uh, that we can certainly do more of here to try to get uh, not just rhetoric, not just statements by the American ambassador, but sound scientific work that's being done at universities in the States and in Europe out to universities, to people like you, uh, but also to get it in a way that people of the larger society can, uh, can benefit from it. Okay. Mr. Ambassador, it's an honor for us to have you here and thank you once again for your presentation. I'm a student of uh, the first course, uh, Department of uh, International Economics and Management. And um, we all here, well, I, particularly I am starting my way here in this beautiful university and um, we all want to know that in the future we will have the possibility to find our job and uh, to have a good payment for it. So my question is the following. You said that you've met some graduates from our university. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you say about the quality of their knowledge and um, uh, can these students here be competitive on the global market and um, be useful for companies not only in Ukraine, but for example in the European Union or in the United States of America? Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. We were uh, talking with the rector before about uh, Konstantin Zhivago. Uh, do you all know? I think uh, his, his, his spouse works here. Maybe she's here. I don't know. She's, are you? Is, yeah. Constantine's a good example. He's, he's a billionaire and he's, what, 38 or 39 years old. But what Constantine has done is, is registered his companies on the London Stock Exchange. And what that means is he has to be transparent. He has to go up before a board who's going to be tough on him and say, why the hell are you spending that kind of money on a new uh, $40 million on American Caterpillar uh, tractors that are going to be working the iron ore mines down at Komsomolsk. And his answer is, that's the best stuff you can buy in the world. Of course, I'm proud of that. I'm the American ambassador. But, you know, he does that, and he does it in a very honest and a straightforward way. I've met people in the RADA. I've met people in government who are graduates of this institution. And I'll tell you, very honestly, very straightforwardly, they're, they're, they're superb people. They're smart. They know what they're doing. So I'm not just, you know, is, you know, you know the expression in English, blowing smoke? I'm not blowing smoke at you when I say you're in one of the best institutions in the country. But, you know, you guys are, you wouldn't be here if you weren't smart and you weren't successful. But what that also does is puts an obligation on you. If you want to be Constantine Zhivago, you can do it. But if you want to be a government minister who takes down corruption and changes the nature of this country, you can do that too. But you've got to stay faithful to your principles and you've got to keep your eye out for the country, not just for your own personal finance. You've got to look for your, for your country. And I say that you can do that in business too. I know a lot of American businessmen who are great patriots, who do things uh, for the country, who don't just do it for their own financial benefit. But if you're in the government, if you want to change things, that's, that's a great thing to do too. I've spent 40, my 40 years of my life in the government. And I, I believe it's, it's a high calling and it's something that uh, if you don't have good people doing that, the government isn't going to be any good either. All right? Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julia. I am the third year student in the Faculty of International Economy and Management. Dear Mr. Ambassador, we are happy to see you at CNEO and thank you very much for an interesting lecture. Uh, so my questions are, uh, does the USA plan to increase uh, the volume of uh, investment to Ukraine? And, uh, does, does USAID? Or does the USA? USA yes. The US, yeah. yes. Uh, and uh, on your opinion, uh, what industries uh, are the most uh, perspective for collaboration and for future investment? Okay. Thank you. Good, Good question. Um, I've been here for over three years now as the ambassador. And for the most part, the big American companies that are here are still here. They haven't left. And that includes the big... Uh, the big uh, uh, agricultural firms, uh, Cargill, Archer Daniels, Midland, Bungie, and the rest of them. But they haven't expanded. They haven't built new grain elevators in Odessa, often because they're afraid of corruption. They're afraid of a raider attack. Somebody's going to come and try to take it away from them. I know a lot of other companies that uh, have looked at Ukraine, and, and you have to kind of stop and uh, get your mindset wrapped around it. People don't just look at Ukraine. The investment banks and the big companies, they look all across the board. They're looking at Eastern Europe, they're looking at Asia, they're looking at Africa, they're look, looking at Latin America, and they're saying, where can I invest strategically that's going to benefit my country that has the great potential of growth over a longer period of time? And I think a lot of people look at Ukraine and they say, wow, 45 million people a country with natural resources, some of the greatest land in the world, potential, potential, potential. And then they look at the court system and the corruption, the stuff I talked about in my speech, and you get to a point, and I know this because we had uh, about uh, three weeks ago our Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman, was here, and she actually told this to the President. She said, you know, Mr. President, I was, uh, when I was out of power, uh, she was in the Clinton administration, she's a Democrat, and then was out when President Bush was in power. I had my own businesses, and one of those was advising companies where to invest in the emerging markets. And too many times, I had companies that say, I get this great opportunity in Ukraine. And then they did their risk analysis. And they said, too dangerous. You know, that's the calculus. I mean, you guys, I'm sure you're learning this in school. When you get out into the business world, that's what you're going to get paid for. Either if you're the big boss or if you're one of the people underneath, you're going to go to your boss, whether he's in a bank or an investment firm, and you're going to say, don't do it. Or I've looked at it, I've done due diligence, and it makes sense. The risks are the following, but I think we can take it and we can win. We can survive. That's what every big company does. And they're looking in this part of the world, they're looking at Ukraine, they're looking at Romania, Bulgaria, they're looking at, at all of the different countries in Central Europe. A lot of them are looking at Poland, and one of the reasons Poland has grown as much as it is is because Poland did the reforms, and they got rid of a lot of the corruption. And a lot of people went in there, again, a very big European country, and the future, they see the future there. That can happen in Ukraine. It doesn't take a lot, but it takes some laws and it takes real leadership. And I think Ukraine can do it. You, you have all of this potential. I mean, everybody says that. I'm sure if you've heard that word once, you've heard it a thousand times. But Ukraine has it and, and, and can prosper. I think there's a lot of American businesses and European businesses that are just waiting for the opportunity. When that moment comes and then, you know, the reforms will be there, the guarantees will be there, the risk assessments will show a better, better result than they do today, and you'll see a lot more money. Most economists say that Ukraine could, get, could take $40 billion a year in foreign direct investment. And today, my understanding is it's about four. And a lot of that money cycled out to Cyprus and back. You know why. That's okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Olesa and I'm a third year student, the Faculty of International Economy and Management. 
so, dear Mr. Ambassador, I want to um, thank you one more time for being here. And um, my question is, according to the latest uh, Doing Business report, uh, Smarter Regulations for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, Ukraine is recognized to be one of the economies uh, having the most improved ease of doing business. Right. Yes, but... Uh, Easier. Still easier. not perfect. <laughs> But one of the most hampering development factor is still paying taxes. Now, entrepreneurs in Ukraine pay about 135 uh, different taxes. So maybe Ukraine um, should take as an example a uh, uh, tax system in, U in USA, and would it help us? <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. It's a good question. I'm always very careful about talking about tax reform because my own personal view is we're, we're not doing a terribly good job of this in our own country. My staff will all laugh at me here if I try to defend the American system. Uh, you, you guys should know, I, I, my wife is a biostatistician. I'm, I'm one of these guys who studied history and uh, geography and literature, and she's the mathematician of the family. So she does the taxes, she does all of that stuff, and she says, you know, basically, if I don't do this, if I let you do it, you'll screw it up, so I, I don't want to get us in trouble. The bottom line is that we have developed an, enorm an enormously complicated tax system, and there's a lot of proposals out there by American experts and by congressmen and senators to simplify our system. One of the things that I hope will happen as part of this process we're going through in the states to reduce our budget deficit is that we will close a lot of the tax loopholes that exist that have been put, put into place by different companies. Now some of these things are perfectly, make perfectly good sense, but others are just special deals for special people. Uh, the, I saw, I remember in January, the bill that went through, uh, the tax bill, it was something like this thick. You know, nobody even reads all of this stuff. But we have to have a system, and I'm really speaking personally here, not as the American ambassador. We need to find a system that makes it much simpler. You. You, Ukraine, need to find a system that's much simpler, that's much more fair, that both makes sure that everyone pays their share, and a lot of people don't, as you know, but at the same time, uh, make sure that uh, everybody pays a fair share and that, uh, that, the, that the medium and small guy doesn't get, uh, have to pay proportionally a lot more than somebody at the top. It's, it's got to be a fair kind of system. And, you know, we're still struggling with this. I, I'm not saying we're going to make it easy. It's, it's a hard struggle, but it's got to start here in Ukraine, I think, as well, because that will also, again, encourage these small and medium businesses, as you recognize. Two more questions. Okay. That's Okay. <laughs> Uh, Timur Firlon, National Radio Station of Ukraine. Um, a half a year ago, the new ambassador of Cuba take his post in Kiev, and I asked him a question: If can Ukraine be a uh, like natural land to for negotiations of USA and Cuba for um, good relations to study negotiations for relations and to cancel the embargo? Thank you. What is your opinion? I think we've got a lot of connections. Uh, we have an intersection in Cuba, and I know there's lots of discussions uh, that go on between Washington and, and Havana about the future of our relationship. Clearly, things are evolving in Cuba right now, uh, and I'm hopeful that the, you know, the situation will improve to the betterment of both of our countries in, uh, in the not-too-distant future. I, I don't, I'm, I, I'm not deputized to negotiate here. That's something that would be done uh, by our guys, I think, in, uh, either in Washington or will be done uh, in Havana. We have, we've always had very experienced foreign service officers uh, assigned in Havana, and uh, those guys would be the ones to do it, not here. Hello? I've got two questions for you. So first is, to your mind, uh, what percentage of uh, high school graduates should enter universities? And then we'll be, and then we'll be the second. I, I, think, I, think the, 
I like to give everybody the chance to go to the university. In our country, we have a lot of people who go to university. I think university helps prepare you for a career, but university also gives you the background to help you have a good life. You know, to have, uh, to have the, to be as happy as you can possibly be in the, in, in the world that we live in. That's what the university can help you. And it can also introduce you to a lot of uh, wonderful people. I suspect some of the people sitting around you here will be your friends for life after attending this institution together. No limits for me. Okay, thank you. And the second is, uh, what can I, as a citizen of Ukraine, do to step forward and to, like, to force my country to develop and to force all these reforms about which you are talking? <laughs> Who, who is the uh, representative in the RADA for, for where you live? Do you know? Okay, number one, find out who that is. <laughs> number two, if it's somebody that you can actually talk to, why don't you go ask him the question? Why, and, and pick out a few of the bills that are pending up there and find out how he's voting on it. I'm not trying to be silly here. You know, people can say, well, we'll go out in the street or we will do this or that. But in fact, democracy, you know, we had this uh, great speaker of our House of Representatives, Tip O'Neill, you remember the great big guy? He always used to say, all politics is local. And I really do believe that. I think one of the things you can do is start with your local RADA representative and, and, and say, and, and find out the, the, some of the legislation and ask him. Ask him what he's doing, or her, maybe it's a her, I don't know. There's not as many hers as there should be in Ukraine, in the RADA. But they sh ask them what they're doing about fighting corruption. Ask them where they stand on economic reform. Ask them where they stand on education reform in Ukraine. And then, you know, go on from there. You, there's lots of NGOs in this society who you can get involved with. There may be, I'm sure there are some here. You can work through them. You can join a political party. But you've got to be active uh, to try to, to change it. There's a lot of people who get frustrated and quit I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, don't quit. You've got to try. And I'd start with your local guy, and if he isn't doing it, then, uh, then move on. We can, do, we can do two more, I think. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Is it okay? Thank you very much. My name is Stanislav. I'm a third-year student, international economy and management. I have such a question, too. Uh, a lot of scientists nowadays uh, define countries... Pro um, country's progress as the growth of happiness and well-being of its people. Mm -hmm. From your point of view, is this new social economic paradigm a new gate into prosperous future or we shall still define economy as the core of the country? Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure I, I understand exactly the question. Say in other words? It, yeah. It just, a lot of scientists think that the progress of the country is in uh, empowering people, yeah. in making them happy, and in increasing their well-being. Yeah. How do you think? Is that um, yeah, I see. Okay. a good You're future for us? You're asking the question between money and yep. values. Definitely. Yeah. You know when we had the big snowstorm a few weeks ago? There was a, you know, when you had the 20 inches of snow, it was crazy. I read this story, or my staff brought this story to my attention that on the road going out to Zhitomer, a bunch of people had gotten stuck in their cars in the snow. And some people in four-wheel drives, SUVs as we call them, came by to try to help them. Good Samaritans from the Bible. And then somebody from the uh, road crew came by and beat up some of the Good Samaritans because they thought the Good Samaritans were taking away the money that they were going to get by taking these people out of the snowdrift. And I thought to myself, what a terrible story. On the one hand, you have these people who, through their good fortune, have a, have a four-wheel drive car that can cut through the snow, and they're trying to help these other people who get stuck in their little Lada or whatever car it was. But then you got these other guys who are out for corruption, you know, to, to get money. And I thought to myself, 
What a moral quandary. And I, I actually asked one of my friends who's an Orthodox priest about this. And he said, you know, it really is a metaphor for Ukraine. We have the majority of people are wonderful, wonderful people with good values. And we've got a group of people who are just spoiled, who are corrupted by corruption. Now, I would argue to you uh, that you want to have a good job, you want to have a career that is satisfying. If it's a lot of money you want, you can do it. But I will tell you at the end of the day, and I'm getting closer to the end of the day, uh, the things that will matter to you the most will be your family, your kids, and what you've done with your life. Now, maybe you're a successful businessman. I'm not saying it's bad to be a successful businessman or a businesswoman. You can do that. But I think the ones that I know in the States that are the most happy are the ones who have been successful in business, but then if they've made a lot of money, they've turned to philanthropy, helped universities, given scholarships to kids who don't have the money, uh, or done other things that are reflective of those human values that I think you, you talked about. I don't, money in itself, I don't think is gonna do it. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have enough money and you have a house and all the rest of it. I, that's perfectly good goal, something that I wanted. But I think in the end, satisfaction in life. And I'll tell you one more story. The great uh, Jewish writer Isaac Besheva Singer, I think it was about 10 years ago, spoke at Harvard uh, at the graduation ceremony. But in addition to his uh, commencement address, he, he met with the students and answered questions. And so one of the young women in the class gets up and says to him, she says, uh, Professor Singer, you're a man of great experience. You've seen a lot of life, the good, the bad, the ugly. What's the secret to happiness? Can we get happiness here on earth? The implication was you have to wait until we go to all go to heaven that we get happiness. And he said, you know, it's a very good question. I still haven't figured it out. But he said, the people that I know that are the most happy are the ones who have married their sweetheart, had kids, and enjoyed, with all the problems that go with raising kids, that process. Those are the happiest people he ever met. I've never forgotten that. One. All right, this is it. The last one. Sorry, guys. My name is Makara Vlad, and I am a student at the Faculty of International Economics and Management. And my question is as follows. We know that Detroit faces uh, great problems nowadays, and uh, would you explain us how can we uh, transform post-industrial cities into the innovative hubs on the example of Detroit City? Thank you. Oh, boy. That, that's that's uh, like a question uh, for another lecture. No, I mean, it's, it's one of the great uh, achievements, I think, of, of my country, that uh, as bad as our automobile market our automobile situation was in 2008, we've reinvented ourselves. I mean, I, I don't know if you remember if you were paying much attention then, but I mean, you can pick up any newspaper and say, America's finished, it's over, it's done, the automobile industry's finished, uh, Chrysler's done, uh, General Motors is down the drain, and, you know, they brought in new innovative people. And that's why, you know, when I talk about innovation, it's not just a word. It's designing cars, figuring out what the public wants, reducing emissions, making them cheaper to drive because you've got uh, better technology, uh, better use of gas, all of the rest of that stuff. And then having good management, trying to figure out how you do a contract with the unions that may get, a short, may get the unions less money in the short term, but will guarantee that the factory survives and doesn't go down the drain and have all of the people laid off or out of work forever, and, and keeping that fundamental core of people together. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a business management expert, but I think there must be some extraordinary stories, uh, extraordinary work that's been done to analyze just what you've raised, and it's a very good question, as to how those guys, I say guys, I mean men and women, because there were a lot of women in those positions, who came in and changed the nature of the psychology changed the way Detroit did its business, changed the way it uh, contracted for parts, uh, 
the, the whole thing. I, I, don't, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I think it's one of the great, uh, great lessons for us Americans, but I think for everybody, that uh, we, we, we took the, you know, the, the automobile industry was down and out, and now we're, I think, still selling cars like crazy. And we're doing it on an international basis, not just in the United States. It's a great, uh, great business story. Well, listen, I've enjoyed very much uh, the chance to... <laughs> One of you said that uh, I give you hope. Well, it's the other way around. I, I told uh, my colleagues that whenever I come and speak at a university, I'm the one who gets hope. I'm the one who gets uh, filled with uh, great hope and respect for the future of, this U of Ukraine. It's a great country. You guys, you've heard it before, I'll say it again, you are the future of Ukraine. Good luck to you all. Dear Mr. Ambassador, we are very thankful for such an interesting, informative and inspiring lecture. lecture. Uh, we are sure that this knowledge will be very useful in our professional development and it is a great honor for us to have such a guest in our university. Uh, we'd like to present the t-shirt with the emblem of the, our university and we hope uh, to see you again here in Kyiv National Economic University.